post-colonial state. Right. The motion for today reads, this house as a post-colonial state would prioritize funding academic research conducted by minorities. First speaker proposition, the floor is yours. Um, hello everyone, my name is Abdul Karim Mujisha. Uh, first of all, I want to ask how the timer is going to be used in the school, it was in the chat. But how... I will add times, I will add one minute, seven minutes, eight minutes, but you are encouraged to use your own time as well, but I will add those timestamps. All right, um, and I'd like to receive uh, the points information from the chat area, if that is right. Um, I guess I can go ahead and start and restart the timer. Okay. Right, so this house as a post-colonial state would prioritize funding academic research conducted by minorities. I'll start off by defining the key terms in this motion and contextualizing this debate. A post-colonial state is a, uh, is a term that's applied to a new nation state that just emerged out of the process of decolonization in the post-second World War period, and one that was once a state under colonial rule, and one that has exhibited features of its colonial master in its political formation. Much like in other developed countries, we find an overlap in priorities of these post colonial states, like quality education, environmental protection, good governance, and many other such things. But one key characteristic, one key identifier of these post colonial states is this need to rebuild an identity that has been destroyed by colonialism. This key aspect of post-colonial states will be important in this debate. Academic research is research focused primarily on creating new knowledge for the community. It's different from professional research, which is usually geared more towards solving a specific problem for some organization, often a business or its customers. We're defining minorities or a, more, uh, a minority group by as referring to a group of people whose practices, race, religion, ethnicity, or other characteristics are fewer in number than the main groups of these classifications. Um, however, we also want to consider the fact that a minority group can mean a group of people who experience relative disadvantage as compared to members of a dominant social group. If we usually find this to going hand in hand. We find that they're less numerically, like they're a lower percentage, usually less than half, but at the same time, they have relative advantage as compared to members of a dominant social group. I'll give you a time, let me first set up the debate. So, according to research done by Elsevier Saival Tool, compared to other regions, Africa has actually been the strongest growing, has the strongest growing scientific production, 38.6% over a five-year period from the start of 2012 to the end of 2016. The number of authors is growing at an equally astounding, astounding rate of 43% over that same period. This is 10% higher than the next fast growing author population in the world, which is that of the Middle East. So coming back to the core identifier of post-colonial states, academic research does play a key role in rebuilding an identity by creating knowledge. And as you can see in Africa, we see a general trend of the growth of academic research. Here's why. The production of knowledge about the third world has taken place in the context of and as an integral part of the unequal relationship between the West and the third world. In this context, one group has the power to articulate and project itself and its worldview on others. The others thus become others, objects to be studied, described, and developed. Overpowered by the hegemonic discourse of the West, third world societies are stunted in their capacity to articulate their own identities and worldview. This is a quote from a sociology lecturer, Tucker Vissen. It shows how the access, the lack of um, the opportunity for African countries to create their own knowledge kind of boosts them back, right? As, as he said, it stands their capacity to articulate their own identities and worldviews. So as you can see, there's a core relationship between academic research and our primary need to rebuild our identity. Now, this is one thing, but another thing that is important in this rebuilding of identity in this research is inclusion. And it's not only a good thing for, the, for, the, for equity and equality, but it is necessary in this rebuilding of identity. African philosopher Franz Fanon in his book, the wretched of the earth highlights the problem of the of uh, an African bourgeoisie, this group of people who challenged the white man and um, I can say dethroned them or removed him from authority. But what ended up happening is 
they were a liberator, then they became our faces. They simply took up the space of the white man. And this simply uh, was a transformation of the political formation that was there, right? They're still an oppressor and they're still the oppressed. And the oppressed are the minorities who are not well represented. So a true democracy must be rooted in the representation of all its people. And as post-colonial states, we all aspire for true democracy. So the voices of the minorities must be considered and they must be heard. It is of supreme importance to include these minorities in this creation of knowledge, in this academic research to avoid the repetition of the colonial hegemonic proclamation. I will now receive your point of information before I continue to the plan, to our plan. Would you say that access to undergraduate degrees is a problem in post-colonial state for minorities? Yes, it is uh, indeed a problem that we face, but so is uh, a minority groups of people, right? People who belong to min with minority status having access to do research. So we have like tertiary institutions, right? It's one thing to get into the tertiary institution and yet it's also another thing to actually engage in research of which we believe research is very important. It's not enough for them to only get in their schools, right? Because we have found as a um, setup that this creation of knowledge is very important in rebuilding our identity, in decolonizing Africa. And if minorities are not represented enough at any stage, whether now or later, this is directly opposed to our aspirations as post-colonial states. So I'll go on to a plan to show how we intend to uh, include these people to include minority people of minority groups uh, in this academic research. How exactly? So let's first look at the fact. At present moment, Africa as a whole already spends about twenty-six billion dollars. This is a rough estimate in academic research. But at present, minorities only receive only a small portion of that. Take a look at um, South Africa. Only eighteen percent of only eighteen percent of the of, res of researchers are black, whereas they constitute much more than that for the total population of, of uh, South Africa. In fact, they are the majority. They are the majority, but they only constitute 18% of the researchers. This shows an immense underrepresentation when it comes to academic research. So what do you want to do? You want to pass through two things. You want to pass through uh, public institutions and you want to pass through private institutions. In public institutions, since governments have jurisdiction over there directly, they can do direct uh, action, direct change. We want to set up uh, quotas, right? A specific portion of the money already um, allocated to improving research, already allocated to co conducting research, I mean, to minorities, right? And this is not one specific quota that's going to apply for all countries, for all the post colonial states, because they have different realities, they have different levels of representation. So by consultation with experts and by basing on the levels of representation, we shall set a quota that tries to meet the overall, I can say, uh, population, the percentage of population of these minorities in research. If we have, let's say, 18% in the general population, it should the, their engagement in research, their representation should be something similar to that. That is through public institutions, it will be a direct intervention. Then we also have through uh, private institutions of which we intend to give incentives, specifically tax incentives to these institutions uh, that are, are, I can say, mirroring or copying the same strategies that we're putting in public institutions. That is to say, uh, putting a quota for these minority groups and they can directly use the models that we're using in these public institutions and then have to happen at the same time. We can first start with public institutions as a starting point. And if we start to see real benefits, this can then be reapplied to private institutions. And there's also a uh, minority serving private institutions, which we intend to increase funding for, to further, uh, I, I can say, improve the academic research that is being done by minority groups. Um, we'll give you a simple case study to see why this is a, is a good thing to do. If you look at the US, the US is a country that was yeah, once organized and to reinstate its identity, Oh, okay, to restate its identity, it had to use academic research, to use academic institutions to restate identity. And we believe the rest of the states can policy. Thank you. All right, we thank the first speaker, Proposition, for giving us that speech. We now call upon the first speaker, Opposition Bench, to introduce us to the case on non-affirmative.
Hello, I'm just checking that I'm audible. Yes. Okay, I'll begin my speech in <clears throat> three, two, one. When I asked the proposition first, whether or not undergraduate degree and access for minorities in the undergraduate level is an issue in post-colonial states, his answer verbatim was yes, it is indeed a problem that we face. And we agree with him. That is a fundamental issue in the status quo. Particularly when we were doing our research, we found a lot of articles about universities in the UK and the US with warrant giving under postgraduate funding to minorities. But when you research about funding for universities in African countries and post-colonial states, you very often hear about inaccessibility to undergraduate research. We give you the example of the fees must fall movement in South Africa, which is rampant and has been going on since 2015, because university students at an undergraduate level, first and foremost, can't even afford that, yet alone a postgraduate degree. We think the proposition bench is advocating for something which is way ahead of where we should be in the first place. Hence, we have a counterpop in today's debate. Our stance is that we would rather prioritize funding to undergraduate degrees for minorities in these post-colonial states. Things like scholarships, things like subsidies, things like grants, financial aids, bursaries being given by the government to allow disenfranchised and impoverished individuals to be able to access this undergraduate degrees, which is a necessary prerequisite for postgraduate degrees. But I'll talk to you more about that later. First thing we need to take care of is this idea from the P1 about how academic research is important in rebuilding national identity. First response here, is the fact that research is inherently inaccessible to the everyday minority who needs their pride to be reinstilled. When you're talking about a post-colonial state, the problem is a lot of people don't have a basic level of education, like even high school, let alone an undergrad, let alone a postgraduate degree. So these aren't individuals who are going to be going through Google Scholar or JSTOR to be reading up about academic articles and journals written by people high up within the realms of academia, and there they're going to get their pride reinstilled from. That's not actually how it's going to happen because they have no formal of education, right? They don't understand like the academic writing, the kind of style, like the level of link like linguistics that they use in those academics writing. It's just not something that they reach out for. Second response here is that we will show you in my speech how we're actually better for funding postgraduate research. But the impact of this rebuttal is that we fulfill one of our burdens, which is to prove that the proposition model was counterproductive to enfranchising minorities. And the other two burdens that we have is that it's an illegitimate mechanism of enfranchising minorities and that post-colonial state funding is, ineff in is inefficient to getting access to academia and academic research. The comparative panel that you need to be asking yourself in today's debate to decide who wins the debate is which side better enfranchises minorities, both within academia and within the economy. Now we'll concede on our side that we trade off having short-term postgraduate funding immediately, but that weighs out and we still can win this debate on these two levels. Firstly, because we solve the issue in the long term as undergraduate is a prerequisite for postgraduate. And so all of their matter isn't mutually exclusive. We get all of those benefits under our side of the house and we'll show you how we get them even better. But secondly, we'll also show you how we get better economic upliftment, which we think is a more pressing concern in these post-colonial states, which in the majority of instances for minorities are facing abject poverty, or facing that as a more pressing concern rather than their intellectual fulfillment. My second speaker will speak to you about that. You'll be hearing three arguments from the proposition bench, firstly on the utilitarian principle, Secondly, in the first speaker's speech, though, about how undergrad is a prerequisite for postgrad. And in the second speaker, we'll be hearing about economic upliftment. Firstly, for the principal argument, we claim that we are more principally legitimate due to utilitarian principles. <clears throat> this is because this is premised by the fact that our model just helps more people. More people attend undergraduate studies and postgraduate research, and the same amount of money can help more undergraduate students than postgraduate students because undergraduate is just far cheaper. This means that the op principle is principally illegitimate because they prioritize fewer individuals over the many. But why is this something that's principally wrong? Because all people are equal, right? And if all people are equal, then the only way to value or measure whether or not one group of people should be prioritized over another group of people is just 
numerical figures, right? If you can do more good for more people, you want to prioritize those people over the people who are in a smaller pool because you can impact less lives, right? And if you prioritize fewer lives over many lives, we think that's something that's principally illegitimate and we can't stand for on the proposition team, but we don't have that harm on the opposition team because we help the numerical majority undergraduate degrees. The impact of this is that we are principally legitimate. But secondly, let's talk about how undergraduate degrees are a necessary prerequisite for postgraduate degrees. And there are a number of things that we need to understand. Here. Firstly, first and foremost, it is a university requirement. No university is going to accept anybody, even if you're a minority or not, into postgraduate research if you don't have an undergraduate degree. The impact of this is that we get more minority postgraduate students because more minority students are going to be able to hold undergrads, which they can use to apply to postgraduate degrees, right? Because you just need the undergraduate degree first before you can even begin to start talking about postgraduate degrees. Now, the opposition team is likely to come up here and say that funding for postgraduate research is the issue. We don't have an issue with the number of postgraduate students or access to postgraduates, but the funding is the fundamental issue. And we'll tell you how we solve that in a number of ways. Contextually, we need to note that there are three actors who fund these universities, uh, who fund postgraduate research. The universities themselves, businesses, private corporations, and government, right? We'll show you by how government focusing on funding undergraduate research, I mean, undergraduate degrees, the universities and the businesses will now be able to fund minorities more at a postgraduate level. But firstly, let's start with these businesses. We need to understand that businesses and private entities fund a lot of postgraduate research simply because they use that to like influence their market decisions and which products they make, right? And Business people who are working in corporation in corporate of employees of businesses, yes. Uh, you talked about okay. how we're prioritizing fewer lives over more lives. You you realize that eighteen percent of black people who are in academic research actually represent eighty one of eighty one percent of the whole population of black people. So how do you make sure that more lives uh, is not just a statistical no, standard no, 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 in no, the no, academia? No, no. Okay, okay, go ahead. You're done. If you're telling me that 80% of Black people in, Af in the country are postgraduate research, that's a lie. That's not true. We're not going to buy that. So businesses are major funders of academic research. And all you need to be involved in a business or to work there is an undergraduate degree. So we think that the more people we give undergraduate degrees to, the more people are going to be working in businesses as engineers or making business decisions. And they're likely to be people who are going to fund other minorities for two reasons, right? Firstly, they're going to fund other minorities because they identify with that person. There's a sense of community with that person. They recognize their struggles. But secondly, they don't have the same bias that other non-minority individuals would have because they themselves realize that they aren't stupid. They themselves know that they're capable. Secondly, because minority undergraduate students will advocate for change in executive leadership structures. Why will they do this? Because they themselves want representation. They all people want representation in whatever university they are. Why will the universities agree? Firstly, because backlash from the public is bad. And two, because universities do not want to disrupt them and they're going to be uh, proud to oppose. All right, we thank the first speaker from the non-affirmative side for that speech. We now call upon the second speaker, Proposition Bench, to come and continue the case. Hello, am I audible? Yes, you are audible. Hello? Okay, well then, um, I guess um, I can start my speech. Um, well, how will I see the time? Um, okay, maybe I can call myself. Okay. 
greater availability of research grants from foundations in the West, foundations that tend to support particular worldviews, enables North Africans and Europeans to visit, study, and write about the third world societies, while third world students and scholars are generally less able to study the West. When they do study, they are often socialized into the dominant paradigms of Western thinking. As a result, some cultures and societies find themselves overdetermined by Western representations, to the point that they can no longer recognize themselves in a discourse that claims to portray them. They are saturated with imposed meanings, ambitions, and projects. In their process of identity construction, there's little dialogue, little exchange of views, little mutual recognition and respect. Because post-colonial uh, post nation's biggest priority is to redefine their identity, to have a sense of identity again, we believe that academic research is a very important avenue for this. We have a third of negative that one not only does not recognize the importance, the very, very large importance of academic research on the continent, but two, rejects this and goes forward towards uh, undergraduate funding and the, the graduate degrees, something which our side never claimed to go against, something that our side never said is not important. What we're saying instead is that research is also very important. It holds a key, it's a key instrument towards development on the African continent. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, everyone else, uh, we, we, we have big problems in our... Um, Point of information. We have big problems in... I'll give you time um, later in my speech. We have big problems in our in their model. They seek to eliminate the point of academic research. Academic research that fuels scientific innovation around the continent. Academic research that seeks to create redefining of our cultural context and our cultural image, erasing, reducing cultural erasure that's permeated around the African continent. They seek to remove a pillar of our development, something which the World Bank has said that is a pillar, is something important. There's a benchmark to how much you're contributing towards academic research and your GDP. This is something very important and they seek to eliminate it. Why do we ask them? Why is it we can't then? Uh, okay, in the case we even agreed that undergraduate um, research has to come before, why not then allow their policy to be implemented and then for us to come back later? They do not show how their policy is mutually exclusive. The only thing they're saying is funding. How you do we to allocate the funding that's coming towards developing the continent and going towards uh, undergraduate research? Something did not say uh, undergraduate and in education. Something they did not show us a clear model for. Our side stands for, uh, for both. Our side, our side stands for increasing accessibility for degrees that are undergraduate and not just undergraduate, no, even oh, secondary. Everything in the education system, I'll give you time later, everything in our model does not erase the progress and need for accessibility in other degrees. But we're saying that something that's so fundamental towards uh, increasing development, something that's so fundamental towards increasing um, progress in our uh, continent, and not just our continent, any other post-colonial uh, nation, then that is needed. And that needs to be inclusive. We asked, we showed them the need for inclusion within this um, in four ways. Number one, we showed how there is a need for increase because um, and in social justice, the need for representation to increase equality of opportunity. Because there's yeah. such pernicious issues affecting, disproportionately affecting um, minorities in certain, um, sorry, I'll give you a few hours later. Um, in certain uh, communities, uh, let's say ethnic groups or um, disabled people, people who are struggling to get education. Because those issues exist, even when it comes to research funding, biases exist within people who give funding. They're not get, getting the most out of it. More importantly, there's also the issue of capacity building. While these people might have the potential, their whole lifetime of being oppressed can decrease the quality of um, research, but we want to increase quality, uh, capacity building. So we've imposed quotas uh, to, in our plan to ensure that there is accessibility. For them and the funding is there and we've shown how there's also the increase of perspectives of minorities when you're writing about gender equality there is going to be a fundamental uh difference between the research output by man and the woman these minority yeah. groups have a unique perspective towards the issues that permeate them we have a simple the statistic we showed you this keep misunderstanding we said 18 percent of research done in south africa is by black uh south africans however 81% of their whole population is African. So one fifth of the research, roughly one fifth is coming from black scholars, but then 81%, four fifths of the population 
is the black people. So that there's a misrepresentation and there's a big divide. What we're saying in our model is nothing to do with removing allocation for funding for uh, uh, undergraduate degrees or anything. We're just setting quotas. There's a lot of money. My first speaker talked about $26 million per year that's going being invested towards uh, academic research. And what we want to do is impose quotas, or quotas that are going to be regulated by experts to make sure that they're fair and we're going to increase accessibility because if the research output is not equitable and fair, there's going to be a big disjoint between the quality that's being produced and the quality that's needed for true development in the continent. We talked about cultural erasure in Rwanda in 1994. If the universities had had this equitable um, a minority representation, the amount of scholarly work that would have gone towards increasing policy to decrease divides between people, the amount of work that would have been done by these scholars, which, who, by the way, they, they, they keep bringing something about like people do not understand academics and scholarly work is done for their needs, which, yes, perhaps that is true, but there's two answers to that. Number one, when you have a study published, of course, you're not going to read the study. The whole of is not going to read the study, but it's going to be reported on by a news organization, which is going to be reported again by another news. And so there's translation to make it palatable for the people. Also, though, something I'll give you a pure eye now. Please notice that the motion is apparently um, at the point at which they say prioritize, meaning you can't prioritize two things. It's either yes, one. Yes, or yes, yes, yes. Prioritize. Prioritize is something here in this motion. And what we understand by this is that there is some funding that's given to these minorities. And uh, no, sorry, funding that's given for academic research. And within it, there is not an equitable way to increase priorities for minorities. So minorities are going to be prioritized in that there's not just majority and uh, sort of simple meritocracy. Instead, there's going to be prioritized in terms of, hey, these people need quotas. These, these people need representation. There's been disproportionately representation represented. Also, there's the point of um, cultural racial that I was talking about. Cultural race is something very important. It's something that's happening across the globe. And more importantly, it's affecting these minority groups. Ethnic groups are being erased. Their culture is being erased. And we want to make sure that that is uh, held within. Um, also, there's misinformed policy decisions. If your policy decision is represented by statistics given by an old that does not, does not account for minority, that disproportionately affects these minorities. What we're saying is academic research and its quality is very important for the nation. Just maybe not the entire population is reading it, but those that matter do. The policymakers are reading it. The doctors who give you prescribed medicine are reading it. Everyone who is influencing the very decisions your life depends on is reading it. And that is something important to increase funding for in terms of minorities being considered. I think that is my time. My first speaker will elaborate on that point. So thank you very much. We thank the second speaker proposition bench for giving us that speech. We now call upon second speaker from side opposition. Oh, can everyone hear me? Yes. yes. All right, hold on. All right, perfect. I'll be starting in three, two, one. The truth is people within developing nations don't have much of a choice. It sounds nice to be able to have academic research and access it, but moreover develop it. But we don't think that the realism of that uh, of, of proposition's case is something that we can vouch for, mainly because of how the very same minorities that we're talking about don't even have undergraduate degrees. The likelihood of us having minority representation in the very same likelihood that they're talking about isn't the reality that most people face. We think that we have two choices. It's either we go for the public and parish natures of postgraduate research, or we have to go for an undergraduate degree and make sure that we have a proper ability of uplifting ourselves economically. We take the latter as South Africa. Two things that I'm going to be dealing with in my speech. 
Firstly, I'm going to rebut most of their case. But secondly, I'm going to show you why we think having to fund undergraduate degrees is the most is most likely going to lead to economic upliftment. But before that, let's deal with a few problems with academia as a whole and why that affects their case. The major problem with academic research and its natures is firstly the public and parish natures of it. So we think that most minorities within their very same policy are going to be forced to public, like public, publicize most of their articles with faulty research um, uh, uh, credibility. This is the most most cases. With, this is within most cases because of how most of the companies that fund these very same projects are people who want instant results. That's bad because it doesn't allow for individuals to really actualize and understand what they're doing within that very same postgraduate degree. So we'd much rather fund something that's much more relevant and something that's most likely going to lead to development because we feel as if that's the most important thing for developing nations to consider. But secondly, we think that it is very expensive. So most of these things are paywalled and most of these things are very hard to access to begin with. So academic research for developing nations, never mind post-colonial uh, nations, are most likely never going to be reached out to the most amount of people, not, like, never even mind the minorities, because of how expensive they are made by government and made by those companies themselves. So the likelihood of us having to get the resources enough to make sure that minorities are represented, even under their policy, isn't likely because of the nature's of these academic researchers to begin with. The second thing that they tell us then is this idea of how South Africa or Africa has a highly growing science field and such, and therefore we need to like have inclusion. They tell us two things that under this. Firstly, that we'll have public institutions for minorities, but secondly, we'll have private institutions to make sure that like the success here is guaranteed. First things first, we think that most of the growing field is mainly compiled of students who have postgraduate degrees, but nothing to show for it. That means two things. Firstly, because of the postgraduate scarcity that there is, there isn't likelihood for us to have minorities within those fields to begin with. But secondly, the same people who make up that field, a small percentage of them are the minorities that we're talking about. So not like you're not likely to get the representation that you're talking about within that very same growing field, but moreover, you're not likely going to be getting the development that you need. We think that we get that on our side. Secondly, thirdly, we think that like there are already public institutions for research for individuals within these um, spaces, i.e. many universities such as UJ and BITS still have research grounds for postgraduate individuals. But why do we think that they don't work? It's because of how these spaces are filled with minorities to begin with. So we don't think that the main priority is pros postgraduate degrees because of how we don't see many minorities there. We think we see minorities within undergraduate degrees without having the funding for that. We do a much better job in having to do, in having to like ensure the upliftment of individuals because of how we prioritize the very same um, degrees that they have. We think that the priority isn't to say that we need to be with the rest of the world. The priority is to make sure that the individuals within our world have the ability to uplift themselves. We think that the, that comparative is quite clear. Edges, you need to make that comparative quite clear for yourselves. But let me do that for you before you deliberate. Firstly, we do that far better because of how we have the opportunities to get much more jobs with an undergraduate degree. But secondly, we think that on our side, you have a much bigger variety of people to choose from. That will be further elaborated on in my argumentation. But what have I told you with this rebuttal? I've told you two things. Firstly, why their site isn't likely to get the minority representation that we've been vouching for. But secondly, why the problems with academia of, overall is something that's likely to be harming the very same um, the minorities within developing nations. Before I move on then, go ahead. Cool. Um, do the 18% no, black academic researchers in South Africa not have undergraduate degrees? You say there's nobody at all who has undergraduate degrees. How about these ones already see, these minorities? That already in research. I really don't get that um, POI, but let's make a comparison. So let's compare the 18% of people who are within postgraduate degrees. 92% of the whole black population is within an undergraduate degree, but don't have funding for it. We think that we'd much rather fund that 92% because of how it's most likely going to be succeeding, but moreover is within dire need of that funding to begin with. We think that we do far better for that population, but moreover we do far better for the minority representation that we need the most. Now, given that, let's get into my argumentation of why we think funding undergraduate degrees is most likely to lead to economic upliftment. How is this possible? First, Firstly, it fits up the, the requirements of getting a job. 
all you ever need as a basic entry for a job is an undergraduate degree. And we think that once you obtain it, two things are likely. Firstly, you are most likely to seek out much more job opportunities on our side. But secondly, the likelihood of you getting intern internships for your studies is most likely going to be a reality because we fix the issue of studying even further on our side. Once you have an undergraduate degrees, more companies would want to develop you because of how they feel as if you have the abilities to expand that uh, like their, their, their grounds and expand the kinds of needs that they have. But secondly, we think undergraduate degrees have a, a, a pool of people at their disposal. That means two things. Firstly, it means that we could simply use the skills and knowledge that we have to create much more jobs and create an economy that we so desperately need. But secondly, people within undergraduate degrees can have more chances of being progressive economically and do things like start a business. We think that on our side, we don't need academic research to continue up with the rest of the world. What we need first is to make sure that we are stable enough as an economy and make sure that we have people who are educated within our fields. We think that undergraduate degrees can still do that in, in in a much better way. But thirdly, we think that we draw attention to, to much more companies to start internships. What this means is that companies would prefer developing individuals and would most likely prefer doing, doing so with undergraduate um, degrees because of how they need the job experience. That means that we ought to cater for what's much more important for the companies and for the students themselves. And we think what's more important is to make sure that people can continuously develop and secure jobs within your company. That means that once you have an undergraduate degree and you're signed by a company, you're most likely going to stay with that company because of how firstly they're funding your studies, but secondly, how you're most likely like just being a huge benefit and an asset to them. Why do we think that all of these things lead to much better economic upliftment? Firstly, you get secure job opportunities. On our side, being given the opportunity to get a job and funding for your studies is something that secures your job space, but moreover, it's something that like makes you appeal to the community and the economy as a whole. But secondly, we think that you get a bipartisan experience. So you can start working while continuing to study to find ways to innovate your workspace. We think that we do that far better on our side. But lastly, we think that you have long-term research development because of how you're in a job space that continues to fund you and continues to allow you to do your research. We think that you're most likely going to have much more long-term research, but moreover, we think that we achieve the very same goal that or that proposition wanted to achieve. We think that we win this debate clearly. Thank you, second speaker, opposition. May we now have third speaker, proposition bench. Can, can you hear me? Yes. Yes. Um, my name is Audrey Murugakatera and my pronouns are she, her, and I'll be, I, I prefer my POIs like uh, you could unmute yourself and then, you know, uh, shoot the POI. And if everybody's ready, I'll be starting my speech in three, two, one. At the moment when more than half of Africa had recently gained independence, in his critique of the nationalist middle class and nationalist parties, Franz Fanon says, privileges multiply and corruption triumphs. Today, the vultures are too numerous, too voracious in proportion to the lean spoils of the national wealth. The party, a, a true instrument of power in the hands of the bourgeoisies, reinforces the machine and ensures that the people are hemmed in and immobilized. The world of the affirmative stands for local scholarships, the creation of um, knowledge that guarantees the true revolution and the colonization of Africa and the restoration of an identity. In my speech today, a few things. Number one, as we defined in a post-colonial state, uh, as, a, as we defined a post-colonial state as one that has a lot of, on its table, but at the end of the day, um, rebuilding an identity is the end goal. I will show how prioritizing funding academic research by minorities guarantees a better world than funding something that is already having funding going to it. And secondly, I will do an, impulse, uh, an impact analysis and show you how we win this debate. But before I do that, a few reputations to the table. Now, uh, the first speaker comes in and talks talks about how these minorities will have other people funding them. They never told us who. And secondly, even if they were there, their support is not guaranteed. And even if it was guaranteed, their support is will be geared towards funding a specific worldview that, it, that will be over-determining the, uh, over the worldview of these minorities. And that's their sponsorship, uh, you know, like their sponsorship, uh, another, another trick in order um, to, to colonize the mind. And the second speaker comes here talking about uh, the problem of academic research, saying that, um, 
it will it will uh, it will force uh, it will force uh, the, the minorities to publish a uh, faulty research. Number one, uh, be we, because of the source of funding, we believe that um, number one, uh, they, they, uh, they they first of come here by acknowledging the expensive nature of the of uh, you know academic research, and we also know that not everyone will be qualified. That's why we have boards that do that. But we believe that in the status quo, these boards are already faulted. Why? Because according to according to uh, the uh, the institutional review board in the U.S., it will consider a few things. But one that is outstanding in the criteria is the physical, social, psychological, legal, and economic risk that minorities are already vulnerable to, regardless of their competence. So we all this is already and this is already manifested in different African states, such as South Africa, where we show that 18% of the, uh, of uh, black people constitute of the academia, when we have 81% of black people constituting the whole population. And secondly, they talk about how there are no minorities in the postgraduate. We believe that representation uh, at the end guarantees access in the beginning. We 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 we. Um, there, there's statistics that shows how you know, in secondary enrollment in Africa, we have 43.6%, um, you know, uh, enrollment. In tertiary school, we have 9.45. And you see that this continues, uh, you know, to uh, to lower as we go further. At the end of it all, we believe that representation at the end should uh, should reflect access in the beginning. Because at the end of it all, without, uh, you know, without showing that there is an end goal, there is no reason, there is no motivation for us to even go for the beginning. So they also talk about, um, they also bring a point of, uh, you know, funding undergraduate degrees. Ladies and gentlemen, we believe that this is problematic on different ways. Number one, uh, they never showed us the, the flows in the status quo. Why? Uh, we already have 130 universities which are growing on the continent. We already, uh, you know, we already have funding that is going to that uh, type of education. So at the end of it, oh, we don't believe, uh, we don't believe that, uh, we don't believe that you know uh, the under. I will give you time. We don't believe that the undergraduate, uh, you know, uh, um, education has a problem. And even if it did have a problem, they never showed us how it is. Uh, it cannot work with our plan. They never showed the mutual exclusivity of our plan to their own. And secondly, uh, they talked about they never removed, uh, you know, uh, you know, research in their whole plan. Talking about how companies, uh, talking about how companies will be, uh, you know, um, already investing in this will they will redirect all that money to um, undergraduate research. They never showed us the incentives for companies that are already interested in research to actually go for uh, to actually go for uh, you know um, the undergraduate research uh, undergraduate uh, education rather than the, uh, the 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 academic research that they brought to the table. So at the end of it all, uh, we believe that uh, you know the stance of an, of, an under, of funding undergraduate uh, degrees uh, you know does not stand because we don't see a problem there. And secondly, because we showed you that uh, you know the the the, the post colonial countries uh, yeah, states do need. Uh, you know to decolonize their minds i'll give you time do need to decolonize their minds but at the end of the day we build an identity through academic research that is the pure source of knowledge creation but before i move on to rebuilding our case your point these most four protests in south africa left some of the top universities on the continent quite literally in flames when protesters set the buildings on fire in an attempt to gain recognition for their movement undergraduate studies in all over the continent are inaccessible and people can't access them due to a lack of funds, due to a lack of representation for them. You can't deny the problem here. Um, I, I, I do understand your point, but at the, from the beginning of this debate, we acknowledge those problems. We acknowledge that post-colonial state has a lot of things going on. You talk about the funding of, uh, you know, uh, undergraduate. You talk about lack of access and all that stuff. And we did not remove that from the table of any government in a post-colonial state. We do not remove that. There is already money that is going there. What our side comes here and says is that there is money that is going to an academic, uh, to uh, to an academic research field, and that money amounts to twenty six billion US dollars. How about we make this money work its best? How about we make this money? be the source of our end goal as a post-colonial state, being able to rebuild an identity that was, that was uh, you know, like that was lost through colonization. And you never tackle that. So um, at the end of it all, we have two sides, ladies and gentlemen. We have the affirmative side that brings the true decolonization of Africa, that brings access from the present policies and reverse the effects of colonization in a way that we are able to make sure that somebody at the, at the end, at the end of the tunnel is represented to give hope, to give, uh, to, to show, to, to show light, to uh, you know, to light, to light that that path, and be able to bring uh, the true change that we want to see. And secondly, 
And secondly, I also talked about how, um, you know, um, the negative side, look at how the world of the negative side looks like. We have no identity. We remain in the hold of colonization. And these undergraduate are, you know, like uh, degrees. They are all founded on European education. They are all founded on the Western education. We are not creating our own knowledge at the end of the day. And secondly, the, they're bringing mis misinformed uh, policy decision, whereby they never showed us the necessity of, you know, like uh, uh, redirecting funds in an academic research and they never showed us even the possibility of doing that because we have 1% of the whole total GDP that is constantly uh, you know, allocated to research and that is growing at a steady uh, you know, uh, at a steady rate. And they never showed us the possibility of doing that. There are jurisdictions. And secondly, uh, they, they widen the gap in knowledge. They widen the gap uh, whereby my second speaker comes here and, told, and tells you how you know, European and Western have the right to come here and collect data. But at the same time, we do not even have the right to collect our own data. We don't have the means to collect on that and through the, the people who are most vulnerable to problems in our own society. And thirdly, they increase dependency on foreign education, which is not specific to our context. They talk about how they are, they are bringing more impacts and they never showed us how they're even making that possible. And, and lastly, even if it, they, it was to pass through, it would be a bad idea because they are all, they are, all they're doing is making us uh, you know, in, uh, depend more on for, uh, foreign uh, knowledge. They never, um, they never answered our harms of like social justice needed for representation and equality of opportunities. Perspectives of minorities that are left out, the widening of our understanding of competences, because at the end of the day, I told you that the criteria that most review board have uh, in the in their world is like making sure that you know there are no physical uh there are no social you know um restrictions which are the key factors that are you know that are create the base of biases in this world the biases against a woman how long was it for a woman to even sit, sit behind this camera and talk what i just talked how long was it for a blind person to be able to even read so all the uh, all the uh, the accessibility that they've been talking about is something that can coexist with our world a world that prioritizes you know minorities in an academic field uh, um, they also they never answer our culture erasure. They never answer how you know. Your time is up. Yes, sorry. Um, at the end of the day, the only thing that separates a minority from anyone else is not disability, ethnic group, religion, or gender. That their whole lives have been narrowed to. It is the opportunity. And ladies and gentlemen, I invite you to our side. All right, we thank the third speaker, Prop Bench, for that speech. We now call upon the third speaker from the opposition side. Um, okay, my pronouns are she, her. I would prefer my POIs in the text um, space. And I'll start my speech in three, two, one. I think what this debate is sorely lacking is some grounding context. When side proposition comes up here and they talk about universities as spaces for revolution and building up our democracies, we think they're not having this debate on the continent. They're not having this debate in reality. Let's so let's give them that grounding context, right? Within Africa and within most post-colonial nations, the basic literacy rate, whether or not you are able to read as an adult is below 60%. That is abysmal, quite frankly. You can't get, you can't advocate for post-colonial studies. You can't advocate for people to educate themselves and people quite literally can't read when there's a 70% rate of youth unemployment, even with a high school education. You can't advocate for this higher education when people can't read, when people can't get basic jobs, right? That is the reality of education in post-colonial nations, right? Within today's debate, there's one main clash and that's on whether or not the two benefits proposed by each side are mutually exclusive, whether or not you can advocate for post-colonial, um, for postgraduate studies and postgraduate um, research without first advocating for undergraduate research. I'm going to prove to you why the second can't be created without the first and why prioritizing undergraduate degrees is the only way that as um, a continent and as post-colonial nations, you're able to develop as a democracy, right? Firstly, 
On side proposition side, they told us that true democracy is created through representation, through rebuilding our identities as post-colonial nations. A few things here. Firstly, while the premise of this argument is something that we can agree with, while we agree that educated peoples and revolutionaries are necessary, firstly, these revolutionaries aren't a lot of the time like a university educated within South Africa. Um, a, lot of information. a lot of our revolutionaries weren't educated. Thomas Sankar from Burkina Faso was not a university educated, but he was a Marxist revolutionary that created huge change for his nation. We think you don't need a university education to have an identity as a nation. We think that in and of itself is a Western idea is a Western idea that we don't value in society. Sec a value um, within a post-colonial society. Secondly, we tell you that you can't achieve like the prioritization of post-colonial education without our benefits. We think your benefits as a side can't stand without ours. Why? Firstly, because we don't think you can even get to the point of being a postgraduate researcher without having an undergraduate degree. They keep throwing out the statistic that 80% of um, university entrants are black within South Africa. But that might stand, but we still think that that doesn't mean accessibility. That is merely a representation of um, the population within our state. These people can't afford um, to have that education. And we don't think that this education is, is giving them the opportunities that it needs to be giving them. It isn't giving them access to postgraduate degrees the way that side proposition would lead us to think. Secondly, we think the top universities on the continent are already in debt with fees, with tuition payments, and they can't provide this funding for both. They can't simultaneously provide 30 million to um, undergraduate studies and provide the same for postgraduate studies. When money is involved, there's always going to be one that is prioritized. And within today's debate, you needed to pick one. And we chose the side of undergraduate degrees because we think that is how um, you create success for postgraduate, for um, post-colonial nations. Thirdly, we tell you that you get actual meaningful change on our side when you have representation in a higher education. We don't think every black person or every minority is going to want to go into postgraduate studies or is going to go into postgraduate studies. If you want actual representation within university spaces, within academic spaces, what you need is people in on an entry level. You can't come up here and tell us that if, your end, if you want the end goal to happen, that's just magically going to create accessibility for undergraduate studies. We need a mechanism here that isn't a benefit that you can come up here and assert and we think that assertion is what's dangerous because it it's what creates um harm in post-colonial nations it's what creates um inequality and inequality and opportunity for minorities within these nations secondly sec the second point that they gave us within today's debate is that um you create like scientific growth and the creation of knowledge um, in post-colonial nations. We think this is more likely to occur on our side in industry. When you have people getting jobs straight out of um, straight out of university and going into industry, going into pharmaceuticals, being able to create our own medical knowledge, this isn't happening in academic university spaces. This is happening in the real world. This is happening when people get jobs as researchers, something that you don't necessarily need a postgraduate degree for. Third, third point they gave us was this idea on cultural erasure cultural erasure and growth. We think this in and of itself is a flawed premise. It shows us that they don't actually understand the nature of university as a space. We think these are spaces that weren't built for, that weren't built for um, black people, for people in post-colonial nations. Our universities are quite literally named after our colonizer, C. Rhodes University. We don't think that these are spaces where you're going to build a culture, where you're going to further the culture of minorities within this nation. That isn't something that you need academic research for. That isn't something that they um, gave to us with, subs with um, substantial argumentation and reasoning for, right? Again, that isn't something that they gave us actual reasoning for. How you create actual growth on our side is through economic upliftment. It's through having an undergraduate degree. But before I move into those responses, I can't take a POI. Go. Yes, is side negative dismissing the 70, oh, is side negative dismissing the 70% literacy rate on the continent that has been growing steadily for the past decade? 
70% literacy rate is good. That is something that we are willing to concede. But when the world average is at a 95% and Africa is quite literally falling behind by a huge margin, we don't think that that is something that we can value. And we think that is something that we want to see continue growing. And through that continued growth, what we need is more money funneled into lower education, not postgraduate degree education. You aren't going to hire the literacy rate when you give people grants to study things that normal everyday people aren't going to understand. That isn't how you increase the literacy rate. Right, how you create actual growth within a nation is economically right. We give you a few things here. We think that tr firstly, true valuable growth comes from economic growth. We think this can only happen with undergraduate degrees. Already we know that in academic spaces, um, postgraduate studies are already losing momentum. You aren't going to make enough money to raise your GDP with that. You aren't going to make enough money to a lot of the time support yourself. We don't think that that is a lucrative area to be studying in postgraduate in academia. We don't think that that creates economic upliftment for individuals, but also on like a nationwide scale. Not only does it not increase your GDP because people will just be earning less, but we think that when you have undergraduate degrees, you have more people going into engineering, going into becoming doctors, going into STEM immediately out of university. We are able to grow as a nation. We're able to gain and acquire more knowledge and uplift ourselves from the from our states. We think that is the only way that you were able to do this. It's cute for side proposition to come up here and talk about building an identity, but when there's a 70% chance of youth unemployment within the nation, that isn't something that's likely to happen. Thank you. Thank you for that speech. We now call upon the leader's response from side non affirmative. Uh, hello, am I audible? Yes, you are. Second, please. Yeah. Three, two, one. Panel. Some of the most interesting ideas I've ever heard have come out of this debate from the side proposition team. Ideas like the colonization of the mind, ideas like how undergraduate degrees are a Western concept. The issue that we have with the side proposition team strategically, amongst many other strategic issues, is the fact that there was no analysis behind this. We heard a lot of these one liners these interesting ideas, but we weren't quite sure what they meant by those terms. We weren't quite sure why those terms were things that were necessarily true, because there wasn't any analysis behind them. Second issue that we had with them was the inconsistency. And I'm going to quote the speakers here. In the first, when I asked the point of information, they agreed access to undergraduate degrees is indeed an issue in post-colonial states. That was in the first. But now in the third, they stated that undergraduate is not a problem, right? And then when we pointed information to them and gave them the context that I gave you in my first, again, about the peace must fall movement in South Africa as evidence, and we gave you analysis as to why it's such a deeply entrenched issue, they then changed their mind again. And the third says, no, we do acknowledge that problem. So the inconsistency on the side proposition team has been another massive strategic issue. The third strategic issue is if you listen to their speeches carefully, there's actually no case progression. The second had eight minutes of rebuttal. And the only matter that we got from them was from the first, and that was about how Africa needs research to reinstill some sort of pride. Comparatively, on our side, we had case progression. In the first, we told you about the utilitarian principle, which was never responded to, which means when you're doing the comparative and you're thinking about the consequential clash, We've already won that because we're the only team that gave a principle in today's debate. We also told you about the fact that we're actually a prerequisite for postgraduate degrees. And furthermore, we told you about the economic upliftment that we get, which is what we think 
these actors actually care about, the mischaracterization of the proposition team, to think that people in developing countries mainly care about like reinstilling their pride. You think that's a genuine thing that you want to do, but more fundamentally, they care about economic upliftment. And that's something that's exclusive to our side because we fund the undergraduate degrees that are imperative to your economic upliftment. A fourth strategic issue that we had with them is this thing of mutual exclusivity. Now, they said that we didn't prove mutual exclusivity in our debate. If you had a regular this house would debate, you would have to prove mutual exclusivity when you're on the side opposition team. But in today's debate, the word prioritize within the motion means that any other alternative is mutually exclusive. <coughs> Excuse me. Because the nature of prioritization is the fact that you can just only prioritize one thing. You can't prioritize two things because that's not prioritization. That's just having two things which you think are important. And so we think that wasn't a strategic issue on our side. And the fact that they spent so much time trying to call us out for something that's quite literally in the motion is a strategic flaw on their side. And lastly, we fell into the trap of just throwing that one statistic over and over and over again in the place of analysis that would have been greatly appreciated. That statistic about 80% of something is something about Black Africans within South Africa. I wasn't quite sure what it was. Those are the strategic issues that we had in the side of proposition team. And we don't think that they can win with all of their homes, right? On their side, they wanted academic research and they wanted that to lead to pride. We showed you how we're better for postgraduate academic research because undergraduate which is a prerequisite. We showed you a utilitarian principle, which wasn't challenged with the principle on their side. And we showed you economic upliftment in my second, which was something that they couldn't even take down, one and two, they didn't offer that kind of efficacy. I'm very proud to oppose. Thank you for the leader's response. We now call upon the leader's response from Team Affirmative. I'm back for the reply speech. So the affirmative side believes there are a number of key judging issues this debate uh, should be judged on, and I'm going to talk about them. Using their principle, the utilitarian principle, which world is a better world? So first of all, I would like to point out that there was a competition in funding in, uh, in this debate, right? So we told them that where we're getting our funding, we're not really putting new funding into our policy, right? It's simply a reallocation of funding uh, that's already meant for academic research to prioritize the minorities, right? It's not like we're investing in new money. So if they want to take this money and put it somewhere else, there is no money to take away unless they intend to take away all the money meant for academic research, which I believe, Judge, you can see the, the, we have shown you the drastic effects of that. So we believe, first of all, if their plan is necessarily, is not taking away all this funding, it would be solved in the first place. And thus, there is no debate here. It's already a win for us. But in the case that they actually do want to take it away from the academic research, let us uh, balance the harms, right? And see which world is a better world. So first of all, we put them this important need of decolonizing Africa, right? And, and post-colonial states, right? They side for postponing our efforts for decolonization and increasing the whole colonization still has on us. It has been more than 60 years since we've uh, gained independence, but we're still playing in systems of uh, colonial masters and they want to keep postponing that. This is something the affirmative side does not side with. They're improving our dependency, and they're not only postponing it, they're making it worse, right? Because they're improving our dependency on foreign knowledge by concentrating our, our academia in undergraduate, which is a system that doesn't necessarily create knowledge. It just bases on systems that have already been created by foreign nations. So they, they don't only postpone it, they worsen it. They increase the hold that we have. And the only knowledge that they, they're allowing us to make is business knowledge, which serves only one idea, which is capitalism, another Western idea. So on this point alone, uh, they want us to be more, decolon more colonized, which is something the affirmative cannot tell it, and it's an a priori argument. The second thing we go to is inclusion and, and social justice, right? This is also a major point of clash. We show you to achieve it at more levels, right? We admit that, yes, there is more need for uh, inclusion at the undergraduate level, but so is there at the academic research level. We achieve it at many levels, and they just achieve it at one, which is an advantage we have over them. And why? And there are really interventions that we showed you that are already there, right? And they didn't trust why they're not enough and how um, them reallocating money makes it actually enough, right? Why it makes undergraduate level better. And again, let me talk about this inclusion thing again. The reach of their inclusion is very limited to individuals and their networks, whereas our inclusion is much more far reaching since this knowledge that is created informs political decisions 
political decisions that affect minorities all over the country or minorities all over the state. So if we're even based on this uh, point of inclusion, we bring much more inclusion, even though we may not be targeting more specific individuals, but the outcome of their work is much more far reaching. So on this point of inclusion and social justice, we also take a debate on that. And we have this other point of a void that they create by completely removing academic research. Think about all the things academic research uh, feeds into, right? Uh, the things it supports. Uh, there is, first of all, like I'd mentioned, policy decisions, right? By removing academic research, we no longer have those policy decisions. It talks about how they're, one, they're the ones supporting economic upliftment, when at the end of the day, they're not, because a lot of economic activity is informed by the academic research. And it's it, in our context, right? It's not from foreign sources, it's in our context, and that's why it's much more important. By removing it, we, we just keep using uh, decisions that are based on things that are not from our context. And they kept saying that we could make analysis, but she have pointed up gaps, and the gaps that they did point to us, we have answered them. And showing you how at the end of the day, our world is a better world that has better benefits for Africa, that it's the more utilitarian world, like our world is the more ideal version for Africa and for post-colonial states. And in their plan, it did not show any specific mechanism how shifting this money is actually going to give more scholarship to these people, how it's going to give more scholarship to, um, to, to minority groups. So at the end of the day, our plan is not counterproductive. It is a productive plan, and there is no grounds on which the opposition side has shown that we should lose this debate. And thus, we, we uh, consider that we're giving a good idea and should thus be implemented. Thank you. And that brings us to the end of this debate. Thank you to all teams for participating. I will invite the panelists to join me in one of the Discord rooms. Let me check which one is free. As we deliberate, team members, please stay behind. We'll be back within for feedback and the results. So panelists, I'm checking the Discord now. Meanwhile, thank you for the round and 